Hey guys, welcome back to Mr. News Art Class. It's wonderful to see your smiling faces today. In today's video, we're going to be talking about compositional design. It's all about how you direct the viewer's eye throughout your image. We're going to talk about creating emphasis. We're going to talk about how we can set the mood. We're going to talk about how we can use each of these different methods of helping the viewer see what's important in your artwork. If you want to follow along on this sheet, you can print it out from the link down in the description below, or you could just draw a couple of thumbnail sketches on any kind of paper and follow along that way. Zooming in onto our first box here, this is under the Creating Emphasis headline. We're talking about contrast. To get a good example of what contrast looks like, let's take a look at Rembrandt's self-portrait. Rembrandt painted many self-portraits during his lifetime, and partly because of these, he became known as the painter of light. Notice how the brightness and vibrancy of color within his face stands out from the super dark background, the super dark coat he's wearing, the darkness of his hair, and even the darkness of the shadows on the sides of his face and under his eyes. So in this box, we're going to create a small image that would just show how contrast can direct the eye towards what you want the viewer to see. Here I'm just going to draw a little bit of a sidewalk and maybe a person walking down the sidewalk. Now here, this is a thumbnail sketch, so I'm not trying to make perfection. I'm just trying to get the general idea. So I'm really just darkening in the area here where a person's body would be. This is like a person running down the sidewalk. So I've got his legs and uh, his arms are going to be bent out one in front and one behind. And some of you might be saying, oh, look, Mr. News drawing a stick person. Yes, I absolutely am. Again, with a thumbnail sketch, we're not trying to get perfection. We're just trying to get a basic plan or a basic idea. Now, uh, so far I have made my person here super dark and to create contrast, what I need is to have a bright area around him. Well, I already do. Um, so I could just leave it at this, but to make the rest of the picture more interesting, because we, we want, you know, an interesting picture. We don't just want one little thing. We want an interesting picture. So what I'm going to do here is create a street lamp hanging up above him. And that's going to be shining brightly down onto him. And this is going to be a nighttime picture. So if it's a nighttime picture, then the sidewalk is going to be sort of grayish. It's not going to be dark right here underneath the uh, street lamp, but there might be a bit of a shadow on like directly underneath our person. And then uh, we'll make the sky darker. But not in this area. We'll make it really dark around the edges of the page. And maybe the, the grass that is down here on the, or, or maybe this is the road. Um, it's hard, you know, with, with the street lamp post coming from right here, this must be the road. It must be grass on the other side there. So if this is the road, well, the road is going to be black anyway, whether it's night or day, but we definitely want it to be black if it's nighttime. So here we have a super high contrast image. We've got a really dark background that frames our little character here. And, and then this bright patch, I'll make it a little darker around here and really pull in this, uh, this street lamp. So we've got our, our figure is all dark and then highlighted with this bright patch around him. And because of that deep contrast, it draws the viewer's eyes right there. You're going to spend very little time looking at the background, the road, the sky, maybe a little bit of time looking at the sidewalk, but most of your attention is pulled right here to this person. 
All right, so another way to create emphasis is to use isolation. To get an idea what that means, we're gonna take a look at a digital painting by Marco Bucci. This is an illustration that can be found in the children's book rendition of Disney's Nutcracker and the Four Realms. And you notice that the girl in the bottom right is all alone. Everybody else is together with another person, but the girl in the bottom right is all alone. That's a great way to create emphasis. Again, emphasis just means a point that your eyes keep coming back to. So follow along here as I show you another way to create that same isolation. Let's make an outdoor scene with a horizon and uh, maybe we'll do another roadway, but this time, you know, another sidewalk, but this time, We'll have the sidewalk coming here and then the road in the middle and then maybe another sidewalk on the other side. So this is the road. And, um, you know, I don't know, we could throw in some extra details like maybe there's a house over here. We don't really need to detail it in right now. Maybe the sun shining in the sky. This will be a daytime picture or maybe a cloud. I don't know, whatever. But to create the feel of isolation, what we're going to do is we're going to have one person on this sidewalk and then a group of people on that sidewalk. So let's start with our figure in the front. Now he's going to be close to us, so he's going to be larger. So maybe not that large. Oh, well, that's no, fine. Person standing on sidewalk. There's legs, body. Um, arms coming down, head. And then in on the other side, these people are going to be smaller because they're farther away. And we're going to have a group over here, maybe two or three people. And they don't all even necessarily need to be at interacting with each other. Like we could have two people talking to each other. Like, um, I don't know, maybe there's a person who is facing towards that house and maybe there's another person who is walking the opposite direction and they're, they're going to be looking at each other, talking to each other. So we'll indicate that by having the arms point in which way they're talking. So those two people are like looking at each other, talking to each other. Maybe there's going to be a third person that's just kind of walking along. And so again, we're just putting little indications of people in here. Like these aren't detailed drawings. These are just, just to get the idea that there's a couple of people here. These guys are together and this person is alone. So when you look at this picture, well, your eyes are definitely going to see these three guys here and, and you're going to be looking at that for a little bit, but your eyes are going to keep coming back to this one lonely figure, figure in the foreground. Moving along to the third box here where it says framing, let's take a look at Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. There is a lot happening in this picture, but who's the most important character at this table? If you're not familiar with the story, this is the last supper that Jesus ate with his disciples before he went to die on the cross. So it's kind of an important historical event, but notice how Jesus in the middle is framed by the window behind him. There's a lot of things in this picture that draw our attention to Jesus, but the idea that there's a window frame behind him almost puts him in a separate picture. You can almost imagine that there's a picture frame hanging in the back, and it's a picture of Jesus in the middle of this painting, rather than him being part of this table, this gathering. He feels separate from it. So what we're going to try to attempt here is to create a, an image where there's like a person walking away from us and there's going to be a lot of things happening around him that box him in. So what we'll do is we'll start with sort of a pathway or a roadway. Notice that I've angled that in to give it some depth or distance. 
and then there's going to be a person. We're going to see him from behind. So we'll see the legs and then the feet are pointed up. They're pointed away from us down that road. And maybe the arms hanging down, the back of the head here. So he, this guy's walking away from us. And maybe at the end of this street, there's going to be some kind of archway, some kind of door frame or archway that he's walking towards. Okay. And then we can have buildings on both sides, but right away that, that archway and the road around him, this acts as a frame. It's almost like we've put him in a picture frame. And so it doesn't matter what we draw around here. Our attention is going to be pulled into this frame and he's going to seem like this is most important, no matter what I do around here. So, I'm going to, in the foreground here, attempt some, some, you know, amount of three dimensionality. Like maybe there's some perspective to these uh, buildings beside him, their doors. And, but then in the distance, it's just going to be like, I don't know, maybe there's like a city, like he's walking down an alleyway and he's going to be going out into the city. And there's going to be a bunch of tall skyscrapers and buildings But again, because of this frame around our character, he becomes much more important than the city in front of him. And moving on to the next box here, we're talking about size or proximity. Now we've kind of already seen that here when I did isolation, this guy is larger and closer. So he feels separate from everything else. But Let's focus in here and, and uh, instead of talking about isolation, let's talk strictly about size and proximity. And to understand this, let's take a look at Andrew Wyeth's painting titled Christina's World. Just looking at this painting, this girl feels very far away, very far away from that farmhouse. And it feels like it is going to take her a long time to get back, especially because we see that she is crawling or pulling herself with her hands instead of walking or running. Notice the size difference. Now, here, the size difference is not between two people. It's between a person and a house. And you can see that the house is like only as big as this girl's head on the page. And that's because it's farther away. As things get farther away, they appear smaller. And so on our page here, to create that sort of feel, what we can do is try to have... Uh, one person in the foreground. What, what we're going to do is is have a couple of people. So I'm gonna I'm gonna draw like like there's a uh, a person got some arms going on, got a way too long of a neck. But you know what? I'm just trying to get the basic idea here. I'm not trying to be perfect. This person is up close where I am going to see some details, right? Like, I'm going to be able to see his face. I'm going to be able to see what, you know, his facial expression is doing. Um, maybe this guy is happy, whatever. Not trying to be perfect here, just trying to get the general idea. Then we're going to have some something in the very far distance. Let's get a horizon back here and let's get, um, like, I don't know, maybe a house and... Maybe there's like uh, a walkway towards a, a, a road or something that goes on back here. And then there's going to be like just, you know, a person, but it's just going to be a tiny little person walking out of that house. But this guy right here is super close to us. So he's huge. Like we see every little detail of him. This guy back here is so far away that we can barely see him at all. And by having this person large and close to us, proximity is how far away are they? So this guy's really close to us. He becomes the obvious emphasis within our picture. So that one is very similar to the isolation one, but even more exaggerated. We just pulled this person way closer and pushed those guys way further or the house way further.
So let's move to placement. And now here it says the rule of thirds. When we talk about the rule of thirds, you might have seen like if you ever ever use a camera, there are little lines on the camera that look like a tic-tac-toe board like this. And what that is, is it splits the frame into thirds, right? There's one, two, three segments across, and there's one, two, three segments down. Now, these points of intersection and these third lines, these lines at every third, can be really useful places to put things. Let's talk about Edward Hopper's Compartment C, car 293. In this painting, notice that the woman sitting on this train car is not framed in the middle of the picture. She's down in the bottom right corner, but she's not all the way in the corner. If we measured, she would be close to the one third line on the right hand side and on the bottom. So on our picture, if we were to draw something similar, we wouldn't draw her here in the middle. We would draw her down at that one third mark in this corner. Or we could use this third line, or we could use the top third line. Either way works just fine, but the point is this creates some uh, tension between the foreground and background. So let's just put a person, let's just draw a little face, neck, shoulders, we'll just do like a little portrait here where we've got a person, just a simple little face, maybe some hair, give this guy some, I don't know, whatever. And notice that the empty space then becomes just about as big, maybe a little bigger than our, our character here. And we could do something interesting in that empty space, like we could make a brick wall. Maybe this is a person standing in front of a brick wall. So we'll make just the indication that there are some bricks on this wall behind him. And what that does is it creates sort of a tension between what we call the positive space or this character, the, the focal point, and the negative space, which is everything else, everything around him. So there's, we can imagine that there would be more happening than there actually is. Now, if we had just framed him right in the middle, then we wouldn't care at all about this brick wall. But what this does is it, it makes both segments important. But clearly our eyes keep coming back to this one third line. Convergence. Let's look at the root word there, converge. When things converge, it means they come together, come together. So to see an example of this, I have a picture here from Josiah Brooks, also known as Jazza. If you're not familiar with Jazza, he has an awesome YouTube channel all about making art. But here in this marker drawing, we see lots of lines that all point towards the main subject, that deer right in the center. We have the lines of the tree trunks behind pointing straight down towards the deer. We have the shadows of those tree trunks on the ground diagonally pointing up towards the deer. We have the rays of light shining down from the sky pointing towards the deer. Most of the lines in this picture point towards the deer. So what I'll do here as an example for that is I'll make an outdoor scene with a horizon and a very distant castle. This doesn't have to be like a perfect castle. I'm just going to get the idea that there's like some uh, towers going on and like a, you know, the portcullis, that's the, the doorway leading into the castle. And this castle is small because it's really far away. But this is going to be our emphasis. This is going to be our focal point. So we're going to have a bunch of lines that point towards that. So let's start with like a road that points towards the, the castle and 
um, I don't know, maybe we'll have like a row of trees over here. They're, like there's a forest. And what I'm going to do is make two lines. I'm going to make a line pointing towards the castle. I'm going to make a line pointing towards the castle. And then I'm going to make my trees between those lines. So here's a tree. And then like to make a row of trees going away from me, I'll again, use those two lines as a guide. And I'll have just a row of trees that notice they're not all super tall. They get shorter as they go farther away. They get smaller as they go farther away. I can erase my guidelines. And then here, just the, the lines that are created by the tops of those trees and by the, the trunks of those trees, they point towards the castle. Okay, I can do the same thing again over here and make another forest like this road splits the forest in half. And so I'll just make, I'll, I'll start with a guideline, make a tree trunk that goes from the bottom to the top guideline, and then just add some of these little branches coming off and make a, a whole row of these trees. But then again, erase my guidelines. So that the trees themselves do the pointing. Okay. And you can see how that row of trees points towards the castle. Now, I don't think this is quite enough. Let's, let's do something interesting in the sky. Let's have what we call God rays. Now, I know that's a an interesting term, but you've all seen it, whether you called it that or not. And that's what happens when you have the sun peeking out in between some clouds. And you have these lines, these big rays of light that shine down. So here I can darken the rest of the sky and darken the rest of the picture. Maybe it's a dark, you know, day, a cloudy day, but then I've got these bright lines, these bright, shiny patches of sky that shine through. And notice that I've got those pointing towards my castle and that all of these lines, the lines from the road, the lines from the trees, the lines from the sunlight, they all converge, come together at this castle. So these are six different ways that we can create emphasis or one part of the picture that becomes more important than all the rest. Now, if you notice here, I really did use all six of those methods. The castle is kind of by itself. So it's isolated. There's contrast because it's darker around and the castle is bright. There's framing because I've got the, like, the trees on this side, the trees on this side, and things going on here that surround it. There's the proximity thing. Like in, in this example, it was what's close to me that's most important. But in this example, it's what's, most, what's farthest away is what's most important. And then uh, placement. Notice I didn't put it right in the middle. I put it in the about the one-third section. So I've really used all six of these methods together in this picture, but each one of them has its own merits and, and times when you would want to use it or not. And that's all about creating emphasis. Now, we can't really talk about composition without also talking about how we set the mood. There's three main moods you can have, active, restful, or powerful. Another way to say powerful would be strong. Now, this doesn't mean like you couldn't have a sad or happy picture. Like this means like I could have an active picture that's happy or I could have a restful picture that's happy or I could have a powerful picture that's happy, right? I could have an active sad picture. I could have a restful sad picture or I could have a powerful sad picture. Like when I say setting the mood, I'm talking about not necessarily what emotion we're dealing with, but how, power, how powerful or how active or how restful that emotion is. So for all three of these, I'm just going to use a knight in shining armor as my subject so that you can see how the same character 
could feel different depending on how you draw it. Zooming in here to understand how to create an active composition, let's take a look at Winslow Homer's The Herring Net. Notice in this picture, the fishers on this boat are not standing up straight. They're not laying down taking a nap. They're at a diagonal. The boat is at a diagonal. The fishnet is at a diagonal. The waves in the water are diagonal. The more things you can do to create a diagonal element within your picture, the more active your picture will feel. As an example, my knight in shining armor could be trudging up a hill. I'm going to make a hill here. It's going to be a rocky, bumpy, dirty hill. And just like before, I'm not worried about trying to get every little detail. I'm just going to get the general idea. So here's a leg and a foot and then his other leg and his other foot. Notice that his legs are bent. They're not straight up and down. And notice that he's as he's trudging up the hill, his body is going to be bent forward. Right? He's not going to be straight up and down. If he's going uphill, he's going to be leaning into it as he walks up. Now, he's going to be wearing a shield and holding a sword. So let's uh, get that in here. Let's get his arm bent at the elbow. So we got nice diagonals. And his sword, we want his sword to be pointing up at that diagonal. So here's his sword and um, his head leaning forward. And then his other arm would have his shield. His shield would be back behind. We're not really going to see it that much. Um, let's see. Let's give him just a round shield back here. Okay. So you can see that our character is diagonal. The landscape that he's trudging up is diagonal. And you know what, just to throw in even more diagonals, let's have the sun up here and have diagonal rays of light going the opposite diagonals. And so here, this picture is a very active knight in shining armor because he's everything in the picture is diagonal. What if that same knight in shining armor takes a nap? What if we want a restful picture? To get a good visual example of a restful painting, let's take a look at Claude Monet's Water Lilies. I can't think of a better artist to talk about for restful paintings. Claude Monet painted so many of these water lily garden paintings. And notice the way that that bridge just lazily goes across the page, and how the water lilies form these sort of horizontal nests of color and this picture just looks like you just you could fall asleep there like you could stop on that bridge lay down take a nap it just looks so peaceful and that is in large part due to the fact that everything is horizontal or sideways we associate that with restfulness because when we lay down to sleep we are horizontal so to put our knight in shining armor into a restful frame. We want a, a horizontal picture. We'll start with a horizon or, or a ground, I guess. And then, I don't know, maybe a rock over here. Our, maybe our knight in shining armor is going to be resting. So like his head will be on the rock, like he'll be taking a nap on the rock. His nose there just to indicate that he's, you know, his head is pointing up. And we're going to see him from the side here. So like his body is going to be bent. And like we're going to see, I don't know, one leg straight out with his foot pointing up and the other leg bent with his foot here. And then we're going to see one arm maybe. And his sword, his sword is going to be laying on the ground. He's not going to be holding it. It's just going to be laying horizontally on the ground. And his shield, um, you know, in the last frame, I gave him a, a, a circle shield. Let's do, let's do more of a, a, what's called a kite shield or a tower shield or any kind of you know, tall shield. 
but we'll turn it sideways. And that way we get much more of a horizontal element here. Now it feels a little unbalanced, so I wanna put something here. Maybe I'll put a fire here, like he's camping, he started a fire, put some logs in there, and a little bit of a flame and a little bit of smoke coming up. Okay, so our knight here is horizontal. He's resting, he's like he's taking a nap. He's camping for the night. And notice that I didn't just put him horizontal. I put his sword horizontal. I put his shield horizontal. And yeah, there's a little bit of diagonal stuff going on with his arm and with his bent knee. That's more just for interest. But mostly this picture is horizontal. And so it feels very restful. Now, it's hard to talk about strength and power without mentioning Superman. Superman comes from DC Comics, originally drawn by Joe Schuster and then drawn by other artists over the many, many years. I think it's been about 90 years since Superman started. But one of his most iconic poses is this right here where he's standing super tall. And yeah, he's got his arms bent, he's got his legs out, but this pose just makes him look super tall. Anytime you have vertical elements like this in your pictures, it strengthens the emotions, makes everything feel a little bit more powerful. So for our knight in shining armor here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have him standing tall and we're gonna have it sort of closer up this time. Let's see, I'm gonna put his head near the top and let's see, let's give him some wide shoulders, but um, let's see, his body is going to be in, in this area, his legs, we're, we're going to see his legs kind of going off the bottom of the page. This arm, like, would be holding the shield, so the shield is going to kind of cover up this side of his body. Right here, and notice that it's vertical, straight up and down. And then his sword, let's see, let's get his arm coming down this way, bending at an elbow, coming back up. And then he's going to be holding his sword straight up. So like it's going to go off the top of the page. Right? Okay. And because he's standing tall and his sword is up and down vertical and his shield is vertical, this feels very strong and powerful. So going back and talking more about setting the mood, I could make any emotion here, but the mood would stay the same. So think about each of these with a happy face, right? If this, if this active character here had a happy face, then it would be, I'm marching off to battle. Yes. And we're going to have victory. We're going to win. And, but we're doing something right. We're moving with that here. If it had a happy face, it would be like, like that, ah, uh, restful about, ah, oh, we just won our battle and now I can finally rest and relax and, and in peace. And then here, if it was a happy face, then it would be more like a, yes, yes, we are going to be victorious and things like that. So regardless of the emotion, the mood will either be active or restful or powerful. Now, this is just nine different examples of how you can make choices before you draw a picture, make choices about what the overall composition is going to look like, how you're going to lay things out, where you're going to put things, how big things are going to be, what direction things are going to be pointing. And you can plan all of those things out ahead of time so that your final picture will have a composition that helps direct the viewer's eyes and emotions in the way that you want. And this is just the basics. There's a lot more that goes into it. We could talk about all the different principles of design and how we put the elements together, but this is enough of a basic instruction here that you now could go make any kind of picture you want. You can make a Christmas picture, a Halloween picture. You could make a Valentine's Day picture. And if you wanted it to be active, you know you need to use a lot of diagonals. If you want things to stand out, you need to have contrast or isolation or convergence. And you know that if you want it to have a strong feeling, you can make things vertical. You know that if you want a restful feeling, you can make it horizontal. And so any kind of picture you want to make, you can use these same thoughts, these same ideas 
to create emphasis and set the mood.